finally at the end of James. This is our, our last one in James. Now, we won't pick up because I'll be away in January, and so uh, we will have some visiting speakers throughout January in the evening. I've arranged for a number of different speakers to come. Uh, but from February, um, we've been in the New Testament in the morning and evening, and I want to try and get back to the Old Testament. So we're going to get back to the Old Testament in the evening, and we're going to look at some of the themes in Proverbs. So rather than just um, preach through Proverbs consecutively, it just doesn't kind of work if you do that because you've got repetitive themes. I'm going to take a whole group of verses that focus on the same theme in Proverbs, and we'll do, deal with a whole lot of different themes from different verses that come from Proverbs. So if you want to do a bit of reading ahead, read through the book of Proverbs, um, just to give you a bit of an idea of what it looked like. But this evening, we're going to finish up in James. Can I also encourage some of you who are mature? This congregation has definitely got younger in the evenings. Um, but can I encourage some of the more mature people here to encourage our young people? As you can see, some of them are stepping up to pray and to do other things in the service, and they need your encouragement to continue doing that. Um, and then one final thing. I know they're not here tonight. I wouldn't expect them to be here tonight, but I think it's worth officially, since this is the service they normally come to, congratulating uh, Jasper and Emily McCrindle on their marriage uh, yesterday, and we as a church would like to just congratulate them officially. Let's pray together. Our Father, what a privilege it is to be able to gather here this evening. Uh, we recognize that you are alive, which means that you are present in this building. And just because we can't see you with our eyes doesn't mean that you have not been part of this service the moment we started. And since you are present with us this evening, we want to pray that our worship of you that continues now with the preaching, we have been worshiping you in different ways, would be just the same as it was when we walked into the service. We pray that we will continue to worship you by bringing ourselves into submission to your word and allowing the Holy Spirit to convict where conviction is necessary, to encourage where encouragement is necessary, to rebuke where rebuke is necessary, and to support us where support is necessary, and perhaps even to warn if we are going down certain paths that would lead to our destruction. So we ask that you would give us the ability to hear your voice to us this evening. For we know that as your word is preached through the power of the Spirit, you enable us to have an encounter with the living God. For Jesus' sake, amen. When I was much, much younger, I went in our school holidays to a friend's house that had a nice swimming pool. There were two of us, three of us all together there. And so being young teenagers, I was 17 at, the at that time, 16 or 17, I can't remember, that's a long time ago, we decided to have a competition to see who could do the most lengths underwater in the swimming pool. And it was about a 12-meter pool, and so the first person got in whose house it was, and he swam four lengths. So that's about 48 meters, half a rugby field swimming underwater. I went next, and the challenge had been set, and I swam four lengths underwater. Don't ask me to do it today. I'm much older. My lung capacity is not the same anymore. And then the final guy got in, and... As he started his lengths underwater, this friend Grant, I still remember him, he's living in the UK now, turned to me and said, Ian, Thomas won't make four lengths. And I said, he's doing pretty well. He said, trust me, he won't make 
four lengths. He got to three and a half, and he was almost home, and he came up for air. And sometimes that's like our faith, isn't it? It's a long faith. It sometimes feels as though your lungs are bursting. When I was at that three and a half mark, I wanted to come up. Everything in my body said, come up, get air. And to keep going, that final half length took every ounce of mental energy and physical energy. And sometimes in our Christian faith, we feel fatigued. It feels like things have got us down, and it feels hard to persevere. And sometimes through temptations, through trials, through just apathy, through deadness spiritually, it may feel as though it's really hard to continue on in our Christian faith. And let me tell you, it doesn't get easier as you get older. In fact, the challenges increase because one of the challenges you have as you get older is to stay fresh in your Christian faith and not to become stale, not to become too familiar with Scripture, not to become too familiar with hearing passages you've heard preached before and to allow God to keep growing you in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. As you get older, you encounter more trials. It's just the way it is. You face more challenges. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's in a marriage that's not going so well. Maybe it's in children who are walking away from the Lord. We all face those kinds of challenges. They increase as you get older. So for those of you who are younger this evening, uh, just brace yourself. And sometimes sheer fatigue sets in and we get tempted to neglect our faith, and some walk away, and James deals with that here. He deals with the need for us to rescue the strays, to ensure that we as a group of fellowshipping believers together look out for one another, look after one another, that we don't allow ourselves to become so centered on our own faith that we fail to recognize those who are struggling and need a little bit of assistance and need a little bit of help and need to be brought back into the fold. Christianity is not a one-man island. We need each other. That's why the author to the Hebrews writes, don't neglect the meeting together. We need to meet together because it's in that mutuality of meeting together that we stimulate one another onto faith and good works, that we get alongside one another, that we look out for those we can see are struggling in our faith. And we get to them and we put our arm around them and we ask them, how can we help them? How can we assist them? So that they don't get to the point where they walk away because they're so desperate in their faith. And James reminds us of that this evening. Firstly, he reminds us of the perilous results of turning away. The perilous, and I've chosen my words carefully, results of turning away. Look at verse 19a and the second part of verse 20. My brothers, if one of you should wander away from the truth, someone should bring him back. And then if you go to the second part of the verse... Whoever turns a sinner from the errors of his way will save him, listen, from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Now, James is dealing with a problem that is a little bit ambiguous in this, in this text, and I'm going to try and explain it to you. When he says in verse 19, my brothers... If one of you should wander away from the truth, who is the one wandering away from the truth? That's the first question we ask. And now before you answer too quickly, it's ambiguous. So is it the believer in the faith who's wandering away from the truth? Or is it an unbeliever who's part of the Christian community who's never really come to faith and they wandering away from the truth? Well, James doesn't make that clear to us. 
And I think it's deliberately ambiguous for a good reason. I think there are times in our Christian community where we have those amongst us who have been part of our community, who have shown kind of signs of faith, who look like they're saved, who have been coming on a semi-regular or if not a regular basis, attending church, maybe even engaged in some acts of ministry, and then suddenly they disappear. Suddenly they're no longer with us. Suddenly they walk away. And we discover that in fact they never were saved. Now Jesus deals with this in the parable of the soils. There are different soils, four types of soils, some where the seed falls and various uh, things happen in those soils. And, and, And sometimes there are those who exhibit signs of life and they look like they're on fire for Christ and then they walk away. When I was growing up in the church that I spent most of my time in as a teenager, we had a young man in there. He was about two years older than me and I got on really well with him. And he was kind of a one of those rebellious teenagers. He got involved in a lot of stuff he shouldn't have got involved in. And he was just a little bit wild. And then there was a a miraculous almost conversion. I'll never forget it because I remember him coming or, or, or giving his testimony. He got baptized. And when he stood up in front of the church and he shared his testimony of what God had done in his life and, and how God had turned him around and, and, and how miraculous this whole thing was, I mean, we were, th- 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 there was hardly a dry eye in the place. And then he went through the baptismal font. And, and the church I was in was down below the floor. You had to walk down into it. Um, And uh, he was baptized, and it was very, very moving. He got engaged in ministry. He helped in the holiday club. In fact, I remember helping him. The the way we did craft back then is we did one craft for the entire week. And so we built these telephones that you could use between wires between uh, these kids. And they only spent a short time each day building that telephone. And on the Thursday night, we spent till 2, 3 in the morning completing the projects that hadn't been completed. On fire for God. Well, sad to say that a number of years later, he walked away. Now my question is, was he ever saved? Was he ever saved? Now as a church, when that occurs, while you and I cannot know that, only God does, It's not for me to make that judgment call. What we should do is spend every energy reaching out to people like that. Getting alongside them, talking to them, praying with them, urging them back into the fold. And if they're saved, they'll come back. Then it may be the believer he's talking about. And we've all experienced this where there are people who are undoubtedly saved and for whatever reason just backslide. You know, faith becomes difficult. Quiet times become non-existent. Prayer becomes something that was so far back in the memory that you can hardly remember how prayer was in your life. And bit by bit, not through one conscious major deliberate decision to decide to walk away, but bit by bit we ebb further and further and further away from Christ. Our attendance becomes a little bit more inconsistent until instead of coming once every two weeks or once every three weeks, we're coming once every six months. And for all intents and purposes, we have walked away from our faith. How was that? I spent two years doing national service. And during that two years of national service, I can count on one hand the amount of times I went to church in that two years. And the only time I did go to church when I went back home on paths was to see friends, not to be at church. And so I got to the end of that two years, and I was in that state. Little decisions that had been made 
Because James says, it's not that this is just kind of a, an apathetic thing, but, but it's deliberate decisions we make. Deliberate decisions, well, I'm going to skip this Sunday. Oh, I think I'll skip next Sunday. I think I'll sleep in this Sunday because it's, it's too early to go to church at nine in the morning. And so I'd rather sleep in, and, and that sleeping in then becomes habitual. And before you know it, six months have passed. And I got to the end of that two years, and I was as backslidden as you could come. And a friend of mine, who was my best man in my wedding, came to me at the end of the year, and he said to me, Ian, there's a summer camp, Baptist youth summer camp, all the churches in South Africa gathering together, be 1,500 kids there. Why don't you come? And so the easy way out was saying, well, actually, I can't afford it. You know, I've just got out of national service. I've got to go to university. I don't have any money. Well, he said, I've got good news for you. The church will pay. How did you find an excuse then? So I went. Reluctantly. And God arrested my soul. And you know, I look back on that, and I'm so thankful for that friend of mine who saw what state I was in spiritually, who reached out and said, come in. And I'm standing here today partly because God used that young man to reach out to me. Is there someone like that here that you know? Someone that you know has been on fire for God at one stage or walking with the Lord has slowly drifted away? Are we reaching out? Are we caring? Are we looking for ways to draw them back? Why? Why is it so important? Well, look what he says. Look what James says in verse 20, the third part of verse 20, to save him from death. What death is he talking about there? Is it physical death? Or is it something far more serious? Well, it's quite clear from the context that James' concern is not some physical death that a person may experience, because that's not the enemy. You heard Matt reading tonight from 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is the law. And, and here, here we're talking about a, a death that is not just a physical death that Paul is speaking about. And neither is James speaking about a physical death. James is speaking about a spiritual death. And the reason that that is so much more deadly is because that spiritual death transports us into an eternity of hell. There's no other way of putting it. Jesus talks about it in very graphic terms. Let me read from Luke chapter 12, verse 5. But I would show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after killing the body, has the power to throw you in hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Now, Jesus is saying the one we fear is God, because after we die physically, he has the power to throw us in hell, not the devil, God. Or, if we read further on in the Bible to Romans, for the wages of sinners, death. Or Revelation 20, 14. Then death and Hades were thrown in the lake of fire. Hear the language. The lake of fire is the second death. But the cowardly, verse 8 and 21. And the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who are practiced magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. That's where death is thrown. This is the second death. Now, you may sit here and say, hang on, Ian. One death is enough, thank you very much. I don't want to have to go through a second one. So what is the second death? The second death is the death that occurs after we die in this world and we are thrown into the lake of fire because we have failed to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so Paul, when he writes to the Acts in chapter 17, verse 30, he says, God commands all people everywhere to repent. And those who choose not to repent, those who harden their hearts, those who choose to walk away from God and reject the repeated efforts of God to exercise His grace, will experience the second death. And the second death is not a death that starts and ends, but it is in a death that continues forever in hell where a person pays the penalty for their sin forever. Now you can see why this becomes such an urgent exhortation to the church. Because what James is saying is if you're dealing with someone who, whether they, let's say an unbeliever who's been part of you and now decides finally to walk away, if they never come back, if that's the state they remain in, then their destiny is the eternal death and hell. If it's supposedly a believer who has proclaimed the fact that they are saved, but they are walking away. If they never come back, it reveals that they never were saved. So make sure you're reaching out to them. Do whatever you can to bring them back. And if they are a believer, what does he say? You will turn them around. You will bring them back. They will re walk away from that life of turning away from Christ. For this reason, for this reason, Jesus Christ comes into the world to pay the penalty of sin so that all without distinction who trust in him can have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God in Christ has done everything to rescue the dying sinner. He can do no more. And you and I are God's agents in this world. And it is through His people, as He sends them out, that we reach out to a lost and dying world. And particularly those we know in our midst who are on the danger, on the precipice of hell. We reach out because the perilous results of turning away is eternal damnation. That's how serious it is. Maybe you know someone in that position. Perhaps there is someone you're aware of. Once they used to be here, no longer. Now they're living in the world, away from Christ. How are you reaching out to them? Are you reaching out to them? Don't let them end up in this perilous position. Secondly, I want you to notice the pressing responsibility of every believer, the pressing responsibility of every believer, verse 9b, uh, 19b, sorry. And someone should bring him back. Now, what I want you to see here is this is not simply the responsibility of the pastors, elders, deacons, or leaders of ministry. There's a sense in which it's easy for us to say, well, you know, I'm not qualified to do that. I'm not equipped to really do that. You know, I don't have the kind of theological training that the pastor has. And if I reach out to this person who's straying, maybe I can't answer all the questions. Maybe I'm going to get uh, flummoxed and maybe I'm going to panic and, and, and I'm going to make a worse job of it and reaching out to them. So, you know, I'll just leave it to the professional. James doesn't give you that option. He just doesn't. He says, no, no. This is the responsibility of everyone. 
And it's an active, a pressing responsibility that you and I must actively engage in looking out for each other. In other words, James is addressing the importance of caring and loving one another. You can't miss that. I've said so often, our faith is not just about us. It's about others. It should be an other-centered faith. And so when we come on a Sunday night or a Sunday morning, it's not just about thinking, well, I'm going to try and just catch up with my friends. Yes, catch up with your friends. Please don't misunderstand me. That's, that's not bad. That's a good thing. But it's more than that. It's not only about that. It's about ensuring that we are on the lookout for everyone in our midst, and particularly those we think may be struggling. And the only way you may find out, because we all put on a face when we come to church, don't we? We all look good when we walk in, and we all put on these, these fronts. How are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. When underneath, we're not so fine. And sometimes it requires a little bit of effort and a little bit of digging and a little bit of asking different questions in conversation with the person before you discover, in fact, this person is struggling spiritually. I sat with a young man here in tears one of the morning because he was struggling with his faith. No one else picked it up, not even me. But there was a young man that I prayed with who was crying because he was having a crisis moment in his faith. And I felt ashamed because I should have known. I should have known. And I didn't. Do you see, that means when we come, we rarely get to know each other, not at a superficial level, not at the house, the weather, what did you do on the weekend level? But at a deeper, personal level. At an intimate level. So we can read and understand when people like that are struggling. And we can reach out to them with God's love and care. And minister by God's grace to their needs. Never forget when I was on this music and drama team, our director used to sometimes have a conversation and with me and he'd say, how are you doing, Ian? And I'd say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm good, I'm fine. You know, that's what we say, don't we? And then he would look at me and he had a penetrating gaze and he would say, how are you really? You know, we ask that so superficially. When I was in a supermarket in South Africa and I had a congregation member come up to me and say, oh, pastor, nice to see you. How are you doing? I said, how much time have you got? And I could see them visibly step back. Uh-oh, what have I got myself into? And I said, I'm only joking, I'm fine. But if you're going to ask the question, make sure you've got the time. Otherwise, don't ask it. We care for one another. You know, Paul talks about this in Romans and, and Corinthians. Let me just read it to you. He tells us to rejoice with those who rejoice, Romans 12, 15. Mourn with those who mourn. 1 Corinthians 12, 26, he reminds us, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. In other words, we need to build into our very fabric intrinsic into the way in which we operate as Christians. This whole idea of supporting, encouraging, getting alongside each other. So that when anyone struggles, they have a plethora, a huge amount of people coming alongside and helping them through their difficulty. You know, there's a wonderful, true story, Johnny. Do you? I'm going to try and inform your ignorance. Who knows Johnny Erickson or has read anything of Johnny Erickson? All the older people put their hands I mean, all the more mature people put their hands up. 
Johnny Erickson Tata was a 17-year-old girl who dived into a, a dam, broke her neck, and was a quadriplegic. She's now in her 60s, and she's been a quadriplegic ever since, and God has opened up a, 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 an incredible ministry. A few years ago, she was spec a spectator at the Los Angeles Special Olympics. Her husband, Ken, was the coordinator for the attack, uh, for the track and the field events, and Johnny was amongst the crowd. That's how your name is pronounced, Johnny. Her, dad, her father wanted a boy, so he called her Johnny, J-O-N-I. So I'm not mispronouncing it. Um, was amongst a large crowd watching the participants prepare for the 50 meters running race. The starter's gun fired and off the contestants raced. As they rushed towards the finish line, one boy left the track and started running towards his friends standing in the infield. Ken blew his whistle trying to get the boy to come back to the track, but to no avail. Then one of the other competitors noticed a Down syndrome girl with thick bottle glasses. She stopped just short of the finish line and called out to the boy, Stop! Come back! This is the way! Hearing the voice of her friend, the boy stopped and looked. Come back this way, she called. The boy stood there, confused. His friend, realizing he was confused, left the track, ran over to him. She linked arms with him, and together they ran back to the track and finished the race. They were lost across the line, but were greeted by hugs from their fellow competitors and a standing ovation from the crowd. My dear friends, that should be the church of Jesus Christ. We're all crippled. We're all crippled by sin. And we look out for one another because sometimes those crippling effects come to the surface. We struggle and we limp along and we wander off the track we start going down paths that aren't going to be helpful for our Christianity. Because we've got people who love us and care for us the way God does, we help each other get back on the track. Thirdly, look at the profitable reward of rescuing the stray. Verse 20. Remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. There are two rewards. One is, the first is, that the rescuing person saves. Now, they don't save them in the sense that they are performing the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, but their effort in reaching out to the one helps that one to turn back. Notice there's a turning back. That implies, it doesn't imply, in fact, it is a word, an, another word for repentance. So there is a, a repentant heart from the person who is strayed. They recognize the error of their ways. They recognize their straying from the path. It's not that the person who brings them back simply tries to superficially pretend that nothing's wrong, but rather they help them to understand and conceive and realize the error of the path that they're on. And they do it in such a loving and gentle way that the person being rescued understands they need to turn away from their sin and they need to turn back towards Christ and they need to come back into the fellowship. In other words, there is an acknowledgement that the path that they're heading on is going to lead to destruction. There is a confession. Repentance precedes forgiveness. And as a result of turning away, they brought back into the fold, back into the church. Once again, they're part of the fellowship. And so they've been benefited by the one who's rescuing them. 
and their sins will be covered. Now, when he says their sins are covered, he does not mean that it's as if the covering hides their sins. No, he means that as they turn back to Christ, his atoning work, his blood, his work on the cross atones for their sin. It covers their sin. His blood takes care of their sin so that they are restored back into perfect fellowship with him. They've broken that fellowship with him. They've walked away into the ways of the world. Now, as they turn back to him, he forgives. And when he forgives... He covers their sins. Their sins are removed as far as the east is from the west. That's the beauty of Jesus. He reaches out and he says, return, return, come back to me. And Ezekiel, he he cries out, turn, turn from your ways. Why will you die? There is this urging. And when they return, there is forgiveness. There is restoration. There is reconciliation. Thus we are reminded in 1 John 1 verse 9, I quote it often, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now maybe there's someone here, I don't know, who's in that position where you are apathetic in your spiritual life. You know it's a mess. God knows it's a mess. You know your quiet times are just Nowhere. Your prayer life is a shambles. And you're going through the motions. Jesus is holding his hand, saying, return, return. There's forgiveness. There's restoration. Will you return? Will you come back? Will you repent? For he covers our sins. That's an amazing concept when you think about it. Instead of you and I paying for the penalty of our sins, God puts them on Christ, who becomes accountable and pays for them through his death. What a savior. And then the person rescue them benefits as well. How? Well, in the sense that they've been engaged in the process of seeing a straying believer or someone who's not even a believer, an unbeliever, come to Christ as a result of their obedience in reaching out to those people. There's tremendous encouragement and benefit for you as the person who experiences that and sees the repentance and sees the coming back to Christ. And God's favor rests on you. So it's a twofold blessing. The blessing of seeing the straying one come back and the blessing that God gives you in being a faithful agent in the restoration of that believer. So who do you know that's straying? Who's that person that is just right on the edge? They could go this way, they could go that way. They're teetering. God encourages us in this letter to reach out, rescue them, Bring them back into the fold. The Lord Jesus Christ waits with open arms to receive them. And if you are not saved, the invitation is still the same. Come to me, all who are heavy burdened, laden and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. There is rest for your soul in Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word this evening. I pray that you would help us as those who have gathered here this evening to be faithful in looking out for each other, caring for each other, reaching out to each other, supporting and encouraging one another, seeking to help those who are struggling in their faith. 
to come back to their faith. Or those who were never saved but part of our company, that you would help us to continue to reach out to them so that they would truly be saved. Give us energy and strength to do that. Help us never to tire. Help us to persevere in this, even though it may come with certain difficulties. Strengthen us by your spirit, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our final song together. <laughs>